All right, I want to start out just by giving a brief introduction into the cell, um, just talking about some of the basic characteristics of it, and then I'll go a little more into detail about, you know, the cell and, you know, the importance of understanding basic cell biology for human anatomy and physiology. All right, so if we want to define the role of the cell, we would say that the cell is the, uh, what's called the functional unit of life. Okay, when we say that something is a functional unit, a functional unit is the smallest part of a, of a machine or a system that actually gives it its function. Okay, so remember all the way back in chapter one when I talked about how, if you look at how we are organized from the atomic level all the way up to the organismal level, okay, we start out as, you know, atoms, all right, and then we join atoms together and form molecules. All right, and then we join molecules together and form organelles. Well, you know, this is supposed to be a mitochondria, and bear with my art here. Okay, now atoms are not living entities. They're just objects, you know, they're, they're bits of matter that we find in nature that interact with one another to form more complex molecules. Okay, and then once mole and then molecules can join together um, based on their, obviously, their atomic structure and you know their chemical makeup and can form organelles okay and what organelles are you're going to learn about these more in detail later on organelles are basically the working parts of a cell okay i mean technically they're not like the parts of a car they're a little more complex than that but we'll just stick with this for now okay so for example the mitochondrion of the cell is responsible for, produce, for producing the bulk of ATP, cellular fuel, okay? But the mitochondrion alone can't drive life because what good is this ATP if we can't utilize it, okay? The nucleus of a cell, all right? That's where all the DNA is found, okay? But, you know, again, what good is the DNA if we can't put it to use, okay? You know, same thing with the other parts, the or, you know, the endoplasmic reticulum, the ribosomes, the Golgi, all these various parts of the cell really, you know, don't mean anything until we put them together to form one functional unit, you know, a nucleus, an endoplasmic reticulum, free ribosomes in the cytoplasm, okay? I mean, I know you don't know about all these parts right now, but you want a little while, okay? You know, mitochondrion to make energy, you know, so the cell can do work, all right? So basically, this is the smallest unit of life right here, the cell, and that's what we call the functional unit, okay? And then as we put more cells together, we can develop specific tissues like muscle tissue, uh, epithelial tissue, fat, you know, adipose, fatty tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and so on. And then we, you know, put tissues together and make organs, organs to make organ systems. Then we put all 11 organ systems together and we have an organism, okay? So, you know, remember this hierarchy of organization that we have, okay? So life begins here at the cellular level, all right? And the function of an organism it basically is the sum of the organism's cellular activity, okay? Com I should say composition and activity, okay? So... You know, you're going to learn that, that all cells have the same few basic parts to them, just in varying amounts, and, you know, cells are very, you know, they're very diverse structures, okay, and, um, what was I going to say? So basically, the sum of these diverse, uh, you know, the diverse activities of these different cells of the human body give us life, okay? So, you know, bear in mind, so for example, we have nerve cells. Okay, you know, we have muscle cells. Okay, we've got blood cells. We've got liver cells. Okay, all these are cells. All these are different. You know, they have the same basic parts, just in different variations. But the sum of the activity, I mean, the liver alone can't give us function. The liver alone has a specific function, but we need more than the liver to keep us alive. Okay, the cells of blood. Okay, these are very important, you know, when it, you know, for protecting us as an immune system, for circulating gases or forming clots to prevent bleeding. 
okay, or to control bleeding, I should say. You know, muscle cells provide us with movement, nerve cells provide us with an understanding of our environment and monitor all of our activity to keep us alive, okay? But nerve cells alone, muscle cells alone, blood cells alone, liver cells alone, and so on, aren't, you know, won't keep us alive. We have to take all these cells and put them together, and then we form the complex organism that we're, you know, that you're taking a class to understand the human being, okay? Or could, you know, or a cat, or a dog, or a frog, okay? I mean, all these other living biologic animals are composed of cells as well, very similar cells to us, all right? And, you know, as I mentioned before, the activity of a cell is dictated by the, um, by the parts of the cell, the organelles, okay? And like I said, we'll talk about the different parts more specifically towards the end of the chapter, but, you know, you're going to learn that, like I said, cells have all these very basic parts, you know, for the most part, not, not all cells have all of these, but you know, in varying amounts, okay? So, for example, you know, I just mentioned that ATP, that mitochondrion produce ATP, cellular fuel. A muscle cell that has a really high metabolism is going to have a lot more ATP than a blood cell, you know, than a liver cell, okay? You know, there are... Um, you know, there are little packets, you know, lysosomes or the smooth ER in cells that are that can be used to break down materials. So the liver is going to have a lot of this, you know, because the liver is what, you know, a lot of people like to say the liver detoxifies the blood and cleans it out. Okay, it's still going to have a mitochondria because it needs to have energy, you know, we need to, it needs to be fueled, but it's main, you know, the cells of the liver, the, a big part of their daily job is to break down material as blood flows through it. Okay, you know, like waste products and things like that. Okay, muscle's main job is movement. All right. So that's what, so basically that's what a functional unit is. The smallest part that can give a machine its function, okay? And for us, and like I said, a cat or a dog, you know, a frog, whatever it may be, it's the cell. All right. Now, in humans, there are, there are over 200 different, there are about 200 different kinds of cells in the human body. Okay. And as I mentioned before, you know, all these cells have the same basic parts. You know, they have a, you know, the basic parts, they have an outer border. You know, almost all of them will have a nucleus and some kind of working parts or organelles on the inside. Okay. But, you know, they have varying amounts. Cells are found in different sizes, different shapes, different organelle compositions. Okay. And as a result, this variety in everything that's listed here in this bullet points, you know, allows for the great diversity of function within us, okay? You know, because like I said, bear in mind that not all cells have all the exact parts that we're going to talk about as we go throughout the, you know, throughout this discussion, but they have a lot of them, okay? And that's nice because, like I said, that gives us a very diverse function and at the same time makes it just more fun to learn and understand. Okay, so I mentioned earlier then, this is, uh, this is my crazy cat Gizmo, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you know, Gizmo, she has, you know, she has nerves just like we do, she has skeletal muscle tissue just like we do, she has um, a liver just like we do, she has a stomach just like we do, she has epithelial cells just like we do, so if she has very similar or identical cells to us, you know, what makes her a little, you know, a foot and a half long animal, you know, a little foot, you know, foot and a half, seven pound animal and versus, you know, myself about, you know, six two one eighty. Okay. So if we have the same cells, you know, for the sake of discussion, what makes us different? Okay, what makes us different? Okay, and you're going to learn later on as we get farther into the chapter and farther into this discussion that there's more to just cells. That you have to have an understanding of genetics and DNA. Okay, the varying amount of genes that control cellular activity that all, that drive life as well. Okay, so there is, you know, genetically we are very different animals even though we have, you know, very similar cells. Okay. So kind of, it's just something to kind of think about, you know, as, as we're going through all this stuff. Okay. And as you already know, cells are small. Okay. Cells are small. When you see this, uh, when you see this symbol right here, that, you know, think of that as micro. Okay. Micro. So the average human cell is about 10 to 15 micrometers in diameter or microns in diameter. You can say that as well. 
All right. Okay, so what does that mean to you? Okay, micrometers. All right, I had a professor that gave a, this the, uh, the, in college. His name was Doc, uh, Doc C, Dr. Gerald Cezado. And I want to pass this bit of knowledge on you because this always helped me remember this or put this in a perspective. Um, these, so what he would say is if you want to try to think about how small a micrometer is, you know, if you, it, it, those of you who are listening right now, um, if you have a dime, okay, and if you're listening to this in another country, I apologize, but if you have a, you know, a 10 cent piece, a dime, you know, pull it out of your pocket and hold it so you can see the diameter of the dime, okay, so you can look at how thick the dime actually is, okay. The thickness of a dime is about one millimeter. Okay, the thickness of a dime is about one millimeter. Okay, now there are 1,000 micrometers in one millimeter. Okay, there's 1,000 micrometers in one millimeter. Okay, so you can kind of get a perspective now of how small these cells actually are. Okay, very, very very small okay so I mean if we say if we say for the sake of discussion that the average cell is 10 micrometers in diameter how many can we pack just into the diameter of a dime okay I mean a lot you know you know we can pack a hundred cells just into the diameter of a dime okay if you know again but that's just if we're going off the average now obviously not every single cell is 10 to 15 micrometers in diameter there are some cells that are only about 7.5 okay those are urethrocytes or what we're going to abbreviate as red blood cells those are very small okay but it's their but their size also reflects their jobs that they have to do okay red blood cells are designed to move through the microcirculation of our body okay you know through small blood vessels called capillaries okay capillaries are only about eight you know micrometers in diameter okay so red blood cells squeeze through capillaries in almost a single file type fashion and then as a result that makes them travel you know that makes them efficient at what they do because you know we use capillaries um you know we use capillaries to whoops made that a little too big to basically exchange fluids between our blood and our tissues okay if cells have to if these red blood cells move through here in, in, a, in a single file type fashion that's almost ensuring or guaranteeing that every red blood cell is going to be involved in delivering oxygen and collecting carbon dioxide from our tissues okay so the size of those cells is important okay you know egg cells or the ova are about the largest that you're going to find in humans they're about 100 micro meters in diameter okay you know and you know what we use the you know this you know the sex cell for or what we call a gamete that's for reproductive purposes you know it's funny that the you know so the the egg is actually the largest cell and the sperm is about the one of the smallest cells you'll find okay but you know those two work together as you know to help form an organism okay neurons nerve cells and muscle cells are very long cells okay you're going to learn next chapter when i talk about histology that muscles that skeletal muscle cells are extremely long when i say skeletal muscle i mean the muscle that's attached to bone okay so if we take a bone here okay we've got a muscle attached to it you know let's say here's a tendon then there's a belly of a muscle then there's another tendon okay the cells of this muscle are the entire length of that muscle okay you've got some muscles in your body that are 12 inches in length so you've got some skeletal muscle cells that are 12 inches in length but that's important because when these muscle cells contract they shorten and as they shorten they pull on tendons and they pull on bones and they can generate a lot of force to create movement okay so so those long muscle cells are quite handy same with neurons okay nerves you know nerves are extremely long cells you know not all but some are okay you have you know a body and then you may have a long axon projecting out i mean you know up to a meter i mean a little over three feet okay you know so some of the nerves that have to travel from your lower back all the way down to your toes are very long okay but that's for communication purposes you know we can send signals over long distances you know very rapidly with these cells you'll learn more about the structure of a neuron and how good at sending signals you know later on okay 
how good it is at sending signals, I should say. Okay, so cells are quite small, but we need them to be small. And another reason they're small is because you have to remember when you look at, you know, when you're talking about cells, these are three dimension these are three dimensional structures. Okay, so basically as cells grow, okay, as cells get larger, all right, um, I can't, you know, 3D. Okay, as you know, as a three-dimensional object is going to grow, its internal volume, okay, um, is going to increase more, you know, out of proportion to the surface area to that cell. Okay, so as a result, it's going to, you know, as the, you know, as the surface area does not grow at the same level that the, that the volume does, that means that it's going to be harder to get nutrients into the cell for the cell to use, and it's going to take longer to get, you know, waste products out of that cell. So as a result, the cell is not going to get the nourishment it needs quickly enough. It's not going to eliminate waste products quickly enough. It's going to die. Okay, so that's a big reason why cells need to be so small as well, and that there's such an you know abundant amount of them. Okay, so that's just kind of a general discussion about how you know how small cells are and the importance of that. Now let's talk about the general structure that you find, um, you know, general composition of cells. Okay, as I've been mentioning throughout this discussion, cells have, you know, the, you know, a lot of common structures, but a good variety of, um, you know, the different parts that are found within them. Now, if we do want to say that cells do have three common parts, we can say that cells have a plasma membrane, okay, a plasma membrane or, you know, an outer border. Okay, don't call this a wall. Okay, do not call this a wall because animal cells do not have a cell wall. Plant cells do. Plant cells have a plasma membrane, but then they have, they also have a cell wall interlying that as well. Okay, so don't think of this as a wall or don't call it a wall. Okay, because, you know, plant cells and animal cells are different in that fashion. Okay. So think of this as an outer border, okay? And the plasma membrane is, you know, as mentioned here, is a very flexible outer border. And I'll talk about the composition of the, of the plasma membrane in a little bit and what makes it so flexible. And the importance of this is the, the cell, the plasma membrane controls the interactions of the cell with its environment, okay? You're going to learn in a little while that there are, you know, these abbreviations, Okay, ICF stands for intracellular fluid. ECF stands for extracellular fluid. Okay, so basically the, the, the plasma membrane, the outer border of the cell, controls how the internal environment and the external environment of the cell interact with one another. Okay, and it's very important that um, we maintain the integrity of the cell membrane because if it does become damaged, that could lead to the demise of the cell. Okay, and I'll talk about the components of this in a little while and more in depth about how the cell interacts with its environment. All right, and then you've got, you know, the next common, you know, the common part that, they, that all cells have is a cytoplasm. Okay, it's a cytoplasm. And... Um, excuse me, cytoplasm and also organelles. Okay, cytoplasm and organelles, all right? Um, so basically what the, so the organelles, as I mentioned before, are the, let's put that cell membrane back together. Okay, so the organelles would be the parts of the cell. Now, don't think of the organelles as like the parts of a car. You know, like you have an alternator, and the alternator has a job of keeping the the battery charged. Or you have a radiator that's, you know, that has, you know, that has a couple, that has some components to it that keep the engine cooled and so on. Or a transmission that we use to shift gears, okay? The parts of a car also have small parts that work in a very... A systematic function, but not in the same way that cells do. Okay, what basically when we're talking about the parts of the cell, what cells are, they're little biochemical factories. Okay, and what these parts of the cells are, you know, like the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondrion, 
okay, lysosomes, ribosomes, a Golgi, whatever it is we're talking about here. What these are, these parts of the cell are, are little membranous sacs that contain enzymes. Okay, and these enzymes, you know, carry out specific chemical reactions that give these organelles their function. Okay, so for example, you know, the nucleus contains DNA. We use DNA as a code to make protein. Okay, and then once we get that code out to the ribosomes, whether they're on the ER and so on, you know, we can, you know, you know use enzymes and other parts to make you know, more complex proteins, okay? So that's basically, you know, and then the cytoplasm is the fluid environment that you find these cells bathing in, all right? Now, bear in mind that cells aren't solid objects like you see drawn in books, okay? Not all of these working parts are found just nice and centralized like you see in the pictures, okay? These are, you know, these are, you know, functional units that are found in very dynamic environments. Okay, they're you know, and they're found bathing in water, the inside and outside the cell, full of water. Okay, so there's a lot of movement going on. So these parts of the cell are constantly shifting and moving around. The nucleus isn't always directly in the center of the cell. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind as well as you're thinking about this. So that's the cytoplasm, and then the organelles, and another major part of the cell that I guess we can kind of list separately because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the specifics of this is the nucleus, okay? Now, not every cell in the body has a nucleus, all right? But, you know, most, you know, most do. The nu think of the nucleus as the control center of the cell, all right? The nucleus is where you find DNA, and as you know, DNA is the, well, essentially the code for life, okay? And there are some specific events that occur within the cell that are specific to the nucleus when we talk about mitosis and cell division, nuclear division, okay? So keep that in mind as well, all right? But again, there are these common parts, a plasma membrane, an outer border, a cytoplasm and the organelles within it, the fluid inside the cell and the parts that you find the cells bathing in. And then not all, but almost all cells have a nucleus that, that control the activity of that cell. All right. So on that note, let's kind of work our way into taking a look at the you know specific parts of the cell and these general parts that I just talked about. All right. So here's kind of a general representation of a cell right here. You know to kind of sum up everything I was just talking about. So basically, you can see this three-dimensional outer border here that we call the plasma membrane. Okay, and this image I forgot to mention is coming out of you know the textbook that we use for my class, Mary Van Hobe's um, tenth edition of Anatomy and Physiology, um, you know in uh, chapter three. So you know it's it's handy to have you know I mean if you're if you're not in my class and you're listening to these videos and you don't have the exact book I'm mentioning, um, you know you can you can easily pull out an anatomy book, a basic cell biology book. You can go on the internet pop up a picture and look at images and follow along as I'm discussing these as well. But I would recommend having your book out as I'm going through this stuff. So, but again, you can see right here that, you know, when you look at, a, at the cell that there is the plasma membrane, the outer border. Okay. We're going to look at this a lot more in depth. All right. And then you look inside the cell, you can see that there, I mean, it's pretty obvious where all the organelles are. Okay. Okay, then you got the organelles, and then all the space in between the organelles, okay, you know, that would be the cytoplasm, you know, the, the fluid inside the cell. And then, like I said, we'll spend some time talking about the nucleus uh, a little more individually later on, you know, the control center of the cell, okay? But like I said, all of these different parts that you see here um, have specific functions to them, but, you know, they also influence and drive the activity of the cell. And in a nutshell, if you really want to understand the basic function of what a cell does, cells are basically designed for, I don't need to write the whole thing out, for synthesizing or making proteins. Cells are just protein factories, okay, and they make different proteins that, that carry out different, you know, that allow the cells to carry out different functions, and I'll talk more to that later on when I talk about genetic control of the cell. 
Okay, so again, this is a general represent a very classical general representation of a cell that you see. But like I said, not every cell in the in the body is going to look anything like this. Okay, I mean, but like I said, they'll have the basic parts. They'll have a plasma membrane. There will be a cytoplasm and organelles, and almost all, but not all, cells are going to have a nucleus within the body. All right. So on that note, let's move on to the plasma membrane. All right, the plasma membrane is what we call the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so we call this the phospholipid bilayer because it's primarily composed of a type of lipid. Well, you can probably guess, called a phospholipid. Okay, so let's kind of draw this out here. So phospholipids are really cool because they are what are called amphiphilic. Okay, and then let's say, you know, this is the cell. Let's say this part we zoomed in on. Okay. So basically when we're looking at phospholipids, all right, as I mentioned, they're, they're, they're what are called amphiphilic. Now remember before I, I, I introduced a couple of terms in chapter two, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Hydrophobic and hydrophilic. If we say a molecule is hydrophobic, it does not interact with water very well. Okay, in fact, if you try to mix it with water, it will separate, you know, like fats and lipids. All right, if something is hydrophilic, okay, it's the exact opposite of that. You know, if you take a sugar or an electrolyte and mix it with water, okay, they're going to react, you know, they're going to mix together. All right, so remember, you know, you know, objects that are hydrophobic are nonpolar or, remember, non charged. You know, whereas hydrophilic uh, molecules or objects are polar. They have some kind of a charge, a net negative or net positive charge or both. Okay. Now, phospholipids, what's unique about them is that they are actually both. Okay, that's what it, that's what I mean when I say amphiphilic. They, you know, one end is pol one end of a phospholipid is polar, one end is nonpolar. Okay, which is very cool because that really helps control how the cell interacts with its environment. Okay, that really plays a you know big influence in how the cell interacts with its environment. Okay, so we call these a phospholipid because there's a phosphate group attached to these heads that gives it a charge. Okay. Now, so basically the end of a cell, so think about this for a second. Earlier, when I wrote, you know, ICF, intracellular fluid, and ECF, extracellular fluid, okay, you know, remember, this is all water. So the cell is in constant contact with water all the time. I mean, it has, it's loaded with water on the inside. There's water all around it in the environment, okay? So you can probably guess which side of this lipid is, um, which side of this lipid is hydrophilic or polar. That would be the, fed, the head of this phospholipid. So the heads are polar, Okay, and then the tails are nonpolar. Okay, so so basically the heads of you know the the heads of these phospholipids face the fluid environments, whereas the tails, obviously, since they don't they you know they 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 don't you know mix well with water, they're trying to separate from the water. Okay, so then you know then when you put these together like so, you form this phospholipid bilayer. Okay, this phospholipid bilayer. All right, which is really cool. All right, now what's what's interesting about this now is you have to bear in mind that the cell membrane is primarily composed of fat. Probably about seventy five percent of the total composition. Of a of a plasma membrane are phos uh, are fats okay phospholipids. All right, so you know so bear in mind that being that the cell membrane is primarily made out of fat, okay, 
there it's it you know polar charged objects do not get in very easily okay you know they can't get by these nonpolar tails there's no getting by those okay because remember polar nonpolar molecules do not interact with one another all right but you know any you know any uh you know molecules that are composed of fat like for example a steroid hormone remember last chapter i talked a little bit about steroid hormones and cholesterol steroid hormones are basically chemical messages derived from cholesterol steroid hormones can pass right in through the freely through the plasma membrane and into the cell okay which is really cool you know but so then the question you should be asking yourself then is how do polar molecules or how do uh, you know, how do ions work their way into cells, okay? So the answer to that is there has to be more than just phospholipids that make up the cell membrane, okay? There are other components of a plasma mem membrane as well that give it its dynamic features and function, okay? And one of those, you know, some of the other parts of a plasma membrane are proteins, Okay, proteins. You've got proteins that are what are called transmembrane proteins. Oops, membrane, not brain. Okay, you've got proteins that are called peripheral proteins. Okay, then you do have some internal proteins as well within the, within the plasma membrane. Okay, so if we kind of doodle this out here. Again. Pardon me if my uh, art is a little messy here, but I'm not by no means an artist. Okay, so if we kind of take a look at this, uh, you know, this plasma membrane, okay, there are going to be proteins. When we say transmembrane, remember the word trans means across. Okay, so there are some proteins that, that travel all the way across or all the way through the entire membrane. Okay, so as a result, you know, typically these are gates. Okay, and I'm going to talk more about these in depth in the later, later on. But remember earlier I mentioned that, um, you know, that charged or polar molecules or ions cannot just freely pass through the cell membrane. But ions are constantly moving in and out of cells all the time. You know, we need glucose and sugar to move into some cells, okay? We need amino acids to get into cells, okay? There are, are lots of charged molecules and ions that do need to get in and out of cells so they can function, all right? And this is how we get around this. We have these protein-like gates that, well, not like, they are protein gates, these transmembrane proteins that open and close, okay? Okay, that allow the movement of polar molecules or polar ions, polar, sorry, to move in and out of cells. Okay. You know, there are peripheral proteins. Okay, proteins that are found more on the periphery of the cell. Okay, and these can act as identity markers or antigens. Okay, you know, these can act as receptors okay there's lots of different functions with these all right um there are what else am i going to say i'll talk and i'll talk more about these again later on when i talk about how the cells and you know more specific examples of these proteins and how cells interact with the environment okay um, you know, glycolipids, okay, there are fats that are conjugated with carbohydrates. When I say conjugated, I mean one, you know, two, two different molecules, you know, are joined together like a fat and a carb or a protein and a carb or a protein and a fat, okay? And basically these, uh, these, these glycoproteins or these glycolipids, you know, they basically... You know, they help basically affect interactions between cells. For example, um, erythrocytes, okay, these, these, car these carbohydrate molecules on the surfaces of red blood cells um, have predominantly negative charges. Okay, so as a result, that, you know, being that, you know, remember, if you take two light charged, um, you know, molecules or cells or ions or whatever, and you try to join them together, they're not going to chemically react with one another. In fact, they're going to, 
you know, not want to react with one another. They would oppose each other. Okay, so basically, these negatively charged carbohydrates on the surface of red blood cells prevents them from sticking and clumping together. Okay, and if you don't have these, these erythrocytes are going to clump together, and that's going to cause massive tissue damage, you know, especially in areas where there's a lot of small capillaries like the kidneys or, you know, the livers or bone marrow. Livers, liver, sorry. Um... Okay, so that's where the carbs come in. And cholesterol is very important as well. Okay, not every animal cell has uh, cholesterol within the plasma membrane, but the higher functional ones do, like us. Okay, and what cholesterol does, cholesterol makes cell membranes more rigid. So you're going to find cholesterol kind of found in between the phospholipids. Okay, and the more cholesterol that's there, the more tough and the more rigid that cell membrane is. Okay. And obviously, vice versa, the less cholesterol that's present in there, the more flexible the cell membrane is. All right. And, you know, for example, the, the types of cells in the body that have the highest amount of cholesterol are what are called Schwann cells. Okay. And these are cells that are, they're like these fatty insulators around the axon of a my uh, the, uh, the, the found in myelin that wrap around the axon of a nerve cell okay and you'll learn more about this when we get to nervous tissue is this fat acts as an insulator and allows nerves to send you know nervous impulses at a much more rapid rate okay so plasma membranes are very diverse okay now like I said bear in mind these plasma membranes are not found nice and rigidly like you see drawn in the textbooks okay these are very very flexible entities all right and you know you you know we use what's called the fluid mosaic model to describe plasma membranes okay and their and their constant movement and their flexibility because remember these cells are found in very dynamic environments where there's a lot of water and interaction you know there's a lot of flow going on within tissues okay so these so plasma membranes aren't always you know cells aren't always nice and round like this they're constantly flexing around and moving around Okay, and then, like I said, the organelles shift around. Okay, so plasma membranes are very flexible as well. And there are some cells that need to be more flexible than others. All right, and I'll talk more specifically about these later on. All right, but that's the, you know, the general structure, and the general layout of the plasma membrane. All right, let's, oops, sorry, wrong direction. All right. I've um, already talked about the plasma proteins. So let's talk about some more specific examples of these membrane proteins. Okay, so one type of protein you're going to find on the surface of cells, okay, is a receptor. Okay, what receptors are designed to do is receive chemical messages. All right, you know, they're designed to receive chemical messages. All right, so as I mentioned before, you know, you know that the, that the overall, that the bulk of the composition of a plasma membrane are phospholipids, uh, you know, a, a fat. Okay, so polar molecules, you know, it's virtually impossible for them to travel freely into and out of the cell, you know, through the, through the plasma membrane. Okay, and most, I mean, most hormones in the body are proteins. Okay, I mean, you know, they vary in their structural complexity and size, but for the most part, they're proteins, and you know proteins are polar. They're charged, okay? But you know that proteins are chemical messages that allow us to, you know, that allow other cells to communicate, you know, glands to communicate with other cells, all right? So then the question is, how does this work? Okay, basically what happens is, now remember, when we talked about proteins in Chapter 2, we said that proteins are globular structures, right? Okay, so if we take a look at one, of, so basically what happened, you know, and these, I'm sorry, I'm talking, my mouth is working faster than my head. Um, now remember to review, I mentioned that every bend, every twist, every coil in that protein gives it a specific shape and a specific function. Okay, so let's say we've got this protein here. All right, and let's say a hormone comes in and sticks to that protein. Okay, and then let's say here is the cell membrane itself. All right. This is a bilayer, so I should 
So then what's going to happen is that protein is going to attach to that receptor. And then these proteins, you're, what you're going to see is you're going to see what's called a conformational change. Okay, remember, as I mentioned in chapter two, when you see the word conformation, you should think shape. Okay, you should think shape. All right, so when this hormone attaches to this receptor, the proteins are going to start to twist and coil. The chemistry of this, you know, the, of the interaction between these two is going to alter the shape of this receptor. Okay, and then what this is going to do is I'll talk more in depth about this when I get to the endocrine system, but this is going to activate what are called secondary messenger systems. Okay, and basically what this is, this is a uh, this is a pathway. So what happens there are what are called these G proteins that are found right next to here. And as this protein starts to coil and twist and change shape, it's going to activate these secondary messenger systems. All right, and then, excuse me, these secondary messenger systems then are going to activate certain metabolic pathways and either turn on or turn off some kind of activity within the cell. Okay, that's realistically what hormones do is they either increase or decrease a specific cellular activity. All right, so that's the, that, you know, that's the importance of having receptors. Now, something to bear in mind about receptors as well is that they are highly specific. Okay, let's say this is, oh, I don't know, let's say this is insulin. Okay, only insulin is going to bind to an insulin receptor. Okay, you know, let's say this is epinephrine. Okay, epinephrine will not bind to an insulin receptor. Okay, because remember, these proteins are, you know, these receptors are proteins that are of certain chemistries and certain shape. Okay, and only these these hormones that are of similar chemistries and, and the right shapes are going to interact with the receptors. Okay, so you're not going to see an insulin receptor, you know, interacting with epinephrine. You're not going to see, you know, thyroid hormone interacting with a glucagon receptor. Okay, and so on. Now, Something you have to keep in mind about this as well, and another important protein that you find, you know, around these cell membranes are specific enzymes, okay? Because one thing you have to keep in mind is that as long as the receptor and the hormone are bound together, okay, what we call the, you know, this receptor hormone complex, okay, as long as they're bound together and this secondary messenger system is on, you know, this secondary messenger system is on, this cell is expending energy, okay? So as long as these two are interacting with one another, that keeps this messenger system on, okay? So once we get the desired response out of this hormone, we need to detach this hormone from the receptor, okay? And that's where enzymes come in. Okay, and, and these enzymes, they, they just separate the hormone from the receptor. The receptor goes back to its original shape, and the secondary messenger system turns off. Okay, this is important because with, you know, it, without these enzymes, or if we were unable to turn this off, the cell would overstimulate itself and potentially die. Okay, so that's why when we get the desired response out of the hormone, we need to, we need to separate this complex and we need to shut off the secondary messenger system because we don't want to over overstimulate the cell and kill it. Okay, so that's the importance of receptors. Okay, now let's talk a little more about gates. Okay, or about another type of a protein that we that I like to call gates. Let me erase all this. <sighs> this technology is so cool. All right, so. Gates. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, nonpolar molecules can just pass freely right through a cell membrane. Okay, they can move right through because of the composition of the cell. Okay, remember, um, you know, remember that cells are, you know, plasma membranes are hydro, they're hydro, both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Okay. Um, and as we take a look at this, you know, as we looked at this earlier, remember that polar molecules or polar ions, you know, charge, you know, anything with a charge cannot just pass freely through a cell membrane. Okay. It doesn't work. Okay. The chemistry just isn't there. All right. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, let's say this is our cell membrane again. 
Okay, there are these gates that we can find. It's a little bigger there. Okay. That are found embedded within the cell membrane. Okay, and these transmembrane proteins. All right. So basically, remember these gates are like any other protein. They're you know they're complex molecules that are bent and twisted in a specific fashion that have a specific shape. Okay. So basically, what these gates do is they open and close. Okay, they open and close just uh, you know to allow the movement of a specific ion or a specific molecule that's big enough to fit through it or small enough to fit through it, I should say, into the cell. Now, in saying that. I want to mention a couple of things. One, these gates aren't like a gate you would find on a picket fence in a front yard. Okay, these gates don't open and close, you know, just by opening a lock or pushing on it. Okay, these gates don't just allow anything through them once they open. Okay, because remember, the chemistry of these proteins, um, you know, depending on the chemistry of the protein, you know, only specific substances are going to travel through a specific gate. So, for example, when we start talking about nerves, we're going to talk about, you know, sodium gates. Okay, we're going to talk about potassium gates. Okay, only sodium and potassium are going to be traveling through their specific gates. Okay, that's it. Sodium is not going to move through a potassium gate. Potassium is not going to move through a sodium gate. All right. So basically, these gates can open and close in a, in a few different fashions. Okay. One of them is by changing the electrical charge. Okay. These are what are called voltage sensitive gates. Voltage. Voltage sensitive gates. Okay. So. Um, so basically, if you want to take a look at the voltage sensitive gate, what we can do is let's draw out the cell here. So what happens, there are some cells in the body, I mean, that have some kind of an electrical charge. Actually, I should say all cells of the body have an, some kind of resting electrical charge that we call the membrane potential. All right. But some cells can alter that electrical charge and which influences the activity of that cell okay so basically once we change that electrical charge of this cell and this cell membrane okay that's going to make the proteins uncoil okay uncoil away from each other and allow the movement of a specific you know ion or molecule through that gate okay through that gate so basically and now so basically what typically happens are when cells become more positively charged, okay, because most rest, I'm going to talk about this more in depth uh, later on, uh, you know, most, you know, cells of the body have a memory potential of negative 90 millivolts, okay, there are some cells that have a charge of a negative 70 millivolts, okay, so if we make this more positive, you know, however we do this, okay, you know, that, that's going to make a gate uncoil and open up. All right. And then as the cell becomes more negatively charged, that's going to make the gate uncoil, or I'm sorry, recoil, not recoil like a gun, but coil back up. Okay. It's going to coil up and close again. Okay. So changes in the voltage of that cell could, it will, in, you know, could influence or will influence these voltage specific gates. All right. There are some cells that opening, you know, that open and close. Um as a result of chemical messages, okay, you know, as a result of a neurotransmitter, let's say, all right, so basically there are these, what are called these ligand-specific gates, all right, so let's say we've got this gate here, and let's say we've got this chemical message, you know, this, you know, that, that you know, this, you know, this ligand-specific gate, when we say ligand, think of a chemical message interacting with a, with a protein of sorts, okay, a receptor or a, or a gate in this case. So when a specific chemical message, you know, like a neurotransmitter or a hormone binds to a binds to a gate, that's going to, you know, remember we we talked about what happens here and we talked about you know receptors when the right message binds to a specific gate, that's going to change the conformation and the shape of that gate. Okay? So as a result, this gate's going to open and then something is going to be able to move through it. Okay, like for example, we're talking about a skeletal muscle contraction. Okay, we're talking about, you know, acetylcholine binding to its receptors. Okay, that's going to make sodium gates open and then bang, sodium is going to pass through sodium gates. Okay, plain and simple. All right, so that's basically, so, 
you know, then there are other gates that can open, you know, in response to pressure, you know, by physically putting pressure on cells and things like that. Okay, but these are the two most common mechanisms that you're going to find, okay, when it comes to opening gates. All right. There are surface proteins that you find on cells. Okay, there are surface proteins you find on cells that we call antigens. Okay. So these surface proteins, you know, when you think of an antigen, think of the antigen as the identity marker of the cell. Okay. Now, it's not like when a cop pulls you over and they ask if you're a driver's license, but if you want to use this, you know, if you want to think about this, go for it. But um, what happens here is, is basically... It, you know, we have these specific antigens. I mean, all cells, not just in us. I mean, a bacteria, a virus, uh, you know, the, an amoeba, you know, they all have some kind of specific identifying marker found on themselves, okay? And, um, you know, these markers are important because these are, you know, these are important for the sake of our immune system. Okay, you know, like I said, these antigens are, you know, again, specific proteins that have specific shapes, okay, and as a result, you know, this, you know, these antigens are what allow our immune system to identify the difference between foreign and cell. Okay, so as you're developing, as you're going through embryonic development, and, you know, you're going through the first nine months of your life, and you're developing an immune system, okay, your immune system is going around your body and surveying, you know, as many antigens as it can. It doesn't quite get to every single cell type in the human body, but it does for, you know, gets most of them, okay? So, by, so typically, by the time you're born, all right, the immune system has surveyed your, has surveyed your cells, and as a result, it, know, it knows not to attack the normals, you know, the cells that originate from you, all right? But we do come in contact to foreign cells every now and then, all right? We come in contact with foreign cells every now and then, like a bacteria where it's not supposed to be, a virus, all right? Um, you know, an amoeba, a cancer cell, whatever it may be, all right? And if it basically, if your immune system does not recognize this antigen, if it does not recognize this identifying marker, simply put, it's going to attack it, okay? And the immune system attacks for the purpose of eradication, okay? And, you know, once, you know, once it recognizes this foreign antigen, it's going to attack until that antigen is gone, all right? So basically, we can take this definition of an antigen a step farther. We can say an antigen is a molecule that can elicit an immune response. Okay. Now, this now your immune you know that your immune system does oh, it does go awry from time to time. Okay. Sometimes your immune system will recognize a self antigen as foreign and attack it, all right? You know, like, for example, of type 1 diabetes, okay, when your immune system attacks the beta cells on the pancreas, or glomerular nephritis, when your immune system attacks your kidneys, all right? So, basically, we would call this an auto immune disease, all right? And we'll talk more about this in a and 2 when I talk about the immune system and immune complexes and things like that, but basically, you know, the immune system isn't always perfect. All right, and that's and that's what happens with an autoimmune disease. Your immune system loses the ability to know the difference between self and foreign with specific cells. Now you have to bear in mind that not all cells have the exact same antigens on them. These, you know, antigens are very diverse molecules as well. Okay, and as a result, you know, the immune system is constantly serving many of them. All right, and you know, the other type of the other major type of um, molecule that you're going to find on the surface of a cell are what are called, I'm sorry, proteins are called adhesion proteins. Okay, you can probably take two guesses on what adhesion, and what adhesion molecules do is they basically allow other cells to stick together. All right, I don't really feel the need to elaborate on that in more depth than I have to. All right, and then there are what are called membrane junctions that you find on, the, you know, on cell membranes as well. Um, these are a little more specific types of proteins, and these have very important functions as well. I don't really want to go terribly in depth with these because you're going to see these more specifically later on. But tight junctions, what these do, these are 
you know, when you look at these, you know, these look, almost look like zippers that stick cells together very, very tightly. Okay. You know, again, there's obviously, there's going to be a lot less space in between the cells than that, than I have drawn there. But tight junctions just adhere cells together very, very tightly. And I mean, these cells can be so tightly wound together that not even water can pass through them. Okay which is good in certain areas of the body like skin and your, your urinary tract and other areas because you don't want, you know, water leaking, you know, water and urine and other parts leaking out of those areas. All right, so tight junctions just adhere cells together very tightly. Gap junctions are found, there are some cells of the body that are spaced that have a lot of space in between them, but at the same time need to communicate with each other. So gap junctions, what they do is they bridge the gap um, between the spacing of cells and allow them to communicate more effectively. And you're going to find this with cardiac muscle cells, okay, because cardiac muscle cells are not as tightly packed as skeletal muscle cells, and, you know, we, but we still need these to communicate at a rapid rate, all right, and you're going to find gap junctions in between these cells that allow for a more rapid transfer of an electrical signal or an action potential between, between them. But like I said, I'll talk more specifically to gap junctions later on. These are basically just ion channels, all right, in between cells with spacing. But like I said, I'll elaborate more on these when I get to the cardiovascular system. And think of desmosomes as being anchors that basically allow that stick cells together more tightly. And I'm going to bring these up again when I, when I talk about, again, cardiac muscle, because in a, in a tissue like cardiac muscle, all right, that you know is made up of small cells that generate a high amount of force, and those desmosomes basically prevent the cells, you know, the, the muscle tissue from ripping apart. Okay, so these are the main. So that's basically the um, the plasma membrane and its functions. I'm going to stop here with this video presentation. In the very next one, I want to spend some more time talking now about how, how plasma membranes control the interaction of the cell with its environment and talk about things like selective permeability, diffusion, and so on. Okay, so that's what the next video is going to consist of. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, folks.